Well, hey, today is a great Sunday. It is a Sunday that I have been looking forward to for weeks and weeks and weeks because partially it is the Back to School Bash, and I think today it's the Splish Splash Bash. But anyway, it's going to be great. We're going to have a great time. We still need you to be out there. We're going to give away backpacks. We're going to love on people no matter what. But I am also so excited, been looking forward to this, because this is the last sermon on sin, at least in this series. And I am tired of talking about your sin. I am tired of talking about my sin. I am tired of discovering that you and I are much better at sin than what we recognize, and that sin is not just a surface issue with us, but it goes down deeply into our core. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do, to remind ourselves that most of us think that we just need a little bit of help and that we're almost there and we're pretty much perfect, but if we just had a little bit more, then we'll be okay. Unfortunately, a Christianity that believes that about ourselves, we really only need a little bit of a Savior. But the truth is, our sin is so in-depth in our lives, it is so perpetrated everything into our hearts that we are nothing but sinners and as a result of that that can be frustrating to us and we join in the Apostle Paul when he writes to Rome and says wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death and the truth is it can't be some small savior some little Jesus it's gonna take somebody so much bigger somebody so much more powerful because we're not just in a little bit of trouble in our sin we're in a whole heap of trouble. And that's why Paul is able to cry out in verse 25, then, thanks be to God because Jesus Christ has come and has set us free. And because of that, we can overcome the sin, even though it's by our nature, we can overcome that. And in the last seven or eight weeks, we've been talking about sin each week, and we've been talking about a particular sin, and we walk into the room, and we start the sermon, and we go, phew, I'm glad I don't have that sin. And by the time it's over, we go, oh no, I've got that sin as well. In fact, there was a meeting of skinny people last week after Jeremy's sermon, and it was a shock. They didn't know that they were gluttons, but after the result of this, they're like, oh no, we're in trouble as well. And today is going to be even worse than any of the other weeks that we've been talking about. And so just prepare yourself because you think, I think we're getting off easy in this last sermon, but in fact, this one may be the most devastating of all of the seven sins. What we've been doing over the last several weeks, if you haven't been with us, is we've been using a a book by Rebecca DeYoung to help guide us in this idea of the seven deadly sins that the church has talked about historically. They're not deadly in the sense that you cannot be forgiven of them. Christ can forgive any of your sins except for the sin of unbelief. He can't forgive that one, but everything else he can forgive. But the church has identified different categories, different capitals, different foundations of categories categories of sin in our life, and we've been looking at those, trying to figure out how to overcome them. And in your uh, worship guide today, you're going to find a listing of the seven sins, and you're going to look for and find seven Bible verses that are the memory verses so that when you feel one of those particular sins, when you're about to commit that sin, that you'll have that scripture that you can commit to memory to go, okay, I'm being tempted here. What does the Bible say? And you'll be able to memorize and to say that verse out loud and respond to that temptation that comes. In case you've not been with us, we have already covered envy, we have covered vain glory, we have covered avarice, which is that dragon sickness that you may not know that you had a dragon or that it was not feeling well, but we discovered that that is true. And then we talked about anger, and some of you were not real happy about that, but we talked about it anyway. And then Jeremy did a great job talking about lust, and then last week talked about gluttony. So for us, there's only one left on the list, only one that we have to give up today, only one sin that we have to kill, and that is the sin of what? Yes, the sin of sloth. Now look at that sin. Doesn't that sin look happy? Doesn't that sin look friendly? Doesn't that sin look all cuddly there for us? Doesn't it look like a sin that you just want to commit? Well, we're going to talk about that fact today, but you may not know a few things or you may not know much about a sloth. And so for us, the sloths come from Central or South America. And today, just for you, we have been able to obtain some exclusive footage of a sloth in its natural habitat. Now, we're not doing this for anybody else. We've got that partnership with the Promised Land Zoo and with special cooperation. They've got cameras all over the world. They kind of have some footage, and so the Methodists don't get this today. No, they're not going to get this. Presbyterians don't get this. Just First Baptist Church today because we have some footage of sloths in their 
natural habitat. And so we've got some pictures of that. Why don't we go to that video and see them there in their natural habitat today? Wait, they're all sloths? That's right, sloths work for the Department of Motor Vehicles, and that's where sloths are normally found. No, 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 not in Branson, not in Branson. We have some of the fastest people in town, in Oxford, our entire country, helping us, the Department of Motor Vehicles. But oftentimes, we will go to places where it seems like that person behind the desk is the slowest person in the world. And that's what you and I typically think of when we think of slothfulness. We think of somebody who is lazy, somebody who is slow. But there are three things that you may not know about sloth and how it affects us. Number one, the, the idea is that sloth is in fact the most dangerous sin of all because it is an act of omission rather than an act of commission. See, these other six sins, you have to do something to commit them. You have to expend energy. You have to have some thought. You have to have some idea. You have to have some kind of plan. And then you commit the sin. Well, the sin of slothfulness is right the opposite. It's a sin of omission <clears throat> it's a sin of not doing something. In fact, it requires you to do nothing. And it may, it may actually be your sin of choice because you don't have to do anything to commit the sin. It's actually not doing anything is the sin. And that's really dangerous for the follower of Christ. That's one thing that's dangerous about it. The second thing you may not know about, that slothfulness is not just laziness, <clears throat> but it's resistance to doing what needs to be done. Slothfulness, the sin that we're talking about today, is a sin of omission. It's the sin of inaction. It's the sin of not doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. And in fact, if we were to take some time today, I bet we would be able to go around the room and to say, is there something that God has told you or that you know to be doing that you are actively not doing? And we could pass the microphone around and we could find and discover that probably in all of us there's at least one thing that we know clearly God has asked us to do that we're responsible for that we're not doing. It happened in my house this morning. You see, uh, this morning I noticed on my way out of the house that the trash can is full. And I don't have many responsibilities around the house, but my, one of my responsibilities is when the trash is full, take the trash out. <coughs> now my wife and I have totally different definitions of what constitutes full when it comes to a trash can. Because as long as the trash is hanging in there, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, it's not on the floor, it is not full in my mind. And so this morning, I know that we're getting to the point that my wife is going to say, <clears throat> and I'm going to look at that trash, and I'm going to go, I should take it out. But I knew this morning that I was going to be in front of you, and I was worried about my hair this morning with the weather out there, and so I just didn't put the trash out today. But I know when I get home, that's one thing I've been avoiding doing that I know I'm supposed to do. And I am being slothful in that. And if I pushed you, just a little bit this morning, I bet I could find something that you know that you're supposed to be doing that you haven't done, and you're not doing it. That's because you're a sloth. Number two, three. That's number two. Yeah, you thought gluttony was a tough week. T gluttony was a hilarious sermon. That was fun. That gluttony was great last week. This is going to be really ugly, and it gets worse. Because number three, the most slothful could be the busiest person you know. Busy people are the biggest sloths in the world. And you go, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah, it makes all the sense in the world because the sloth is avoiding what's supposed to be done, and so they're going to do everything else except for what? The one thing they know to do. That's the reason men love to work lots and lots of hours. Can I work 12 more hours? It's not just the bonus pay, but even people on salary love to work more and more because that way they don't have to go home and deal with wife, and to deal with child, and to deal with conversation. And so the busiest people are really the most slothful because the busier you, you are, the more you're able to avoid what you really need to be doing. And even today, we help you by handing you an electronic device that allows you to check out, no matter where you are, to check out and go someplace else. 
On the surface, slothfulness is laziness, and the Bible speaks much against that, right? In the Old Testament, it says, look at the ant, you sluggard, right? And in the New Testament, it says, if you don't work, you don't what? Eat, right? We love quoting those verses. But that's just the very surface of slothfulness is laziness. See, slothfulness, as I've said, at the mid-level is this idea of resistance to the ought-tos in your life. These are the things you know you're supposed to do. You know you're supposed to do this. Maybe mama told you you're supposed to do this. Maybe spouse told you they're supposed to do this. Maybe God told you to do this. But you know you're supposed to do it, but you're not going to do that. And some of us decide not doing that by not doing anything and eating potato chips on the couch. But others of us will get really, really busy, maybe doing really, really good things, but we're avoiding the ought to's. At the deeper, deeper level, though, it ends up being sleepwalking through life. It's never really ever being in the present. It's being someplace else rather than being where you're supposed to be right at the moment. And this sinfulness penetrates almost everything individually, internally, externally, and culturally, and we don't even know what's happening to us because we have no terminology. We don't know what to call it. We don't know how to name this avoidance of doing what you know to do. The ancients did not have that problem. They called it acedia. And acedia is really the sin of slothfulness as identified in the ancient fathers. Now, if you know anything about language, you know that typically a word from the Greek that has the word a on the beginning of it is going to be the opposite of what the rest of the word means. For the word, for to muse, for instance, means to think, right? You're musing, you're thinking. If you're amusing or you're being amused, you're not thinking, right? If you reverse that, well, the word cedia means care, and acedia means the lack of care. So slothfulness is not just the mere being lazy, it's the ultimately not caring enough about the important things to actually do them and be a part of them. C.S. Lewis called these the shadow lands. These are the areas of you're kind of sleepwalking through life, you're just kind of going through the motions and you're not really paying attention, you're not really being strategic, you're not really being on purpose of your life, you're just kind of living here and there. The other great theologian of our time, Pink Floyd, said this, that it was comfortably numb. Some of you know this song, one of their famous Pink Floyd songs, it's comfortably numb. That's, that, that's a cedia at its work. And it devastates us from the inside, and we don't even know what we're talking about, but many of us, and in fact our entire culture, is caught up in this. So what do we do with it? How do we respond to it? Well, this sounds a little bit like depression, and Kathleen Norris says it's not depression. I would suggest that while depression is an illness treatable by counseling and medication, acedia is a vice that is best countered by spiritual practice and the discipline of prayer. There is depression, there is treatment for depression, there is counseling, and if you feel like you're depressed, you need to talk to a mental health professional. This, but acedia is not necessarily that, though it may look like that. Acedia is ultimately the resistance of God's working in your life. And typically, God's working in your life is not all unicorns and ponies and sitting around and eating cheese puffs all day. It is oftentimes very, very difficult work that many of us don't engage in, thinking it's easier not to, only to discover that we lose even the life that we have. The CD is the lack of care. This is what Avaragus, who's one of the ancient fathers, one of the desert fathers we talked about, he labeled this the noonday demon. And if you were with us when we started the series, the noonday demon is the one that you're in the middle of doing your work and you begin to wonder what it looks like outside. Is it raining? Is it not raining? And we begin to distract ourselves because we don't like what we're going through. This is the idea of having to check email every 30 seconds in the office. It's, well, I wonder what's been posted on Instagram all of a sudden instead of doing your work. It's all these things that distract us to keep us from being in the moment so that we can be someplace else so that we can avoid doing and being what we're supposed to do and be. On the surface, it's laziness. In the mid-level, it's resistance. Deeper, it's in sleepwalking. And ultimately, it's spiritual regression. And it ultimately, it's spiritual resistance to what God wants to do in your life. A CD is what keeps you from coming to church on purpose. It's what gets you out of Sunday school because you don't really want to go to Sunday school. It's what gets you out of a normal Bible study that you're doing because I don't have time for that. I don't want to do that. It keeps you out of getting up early in men's Bible study because I don't want to get up early because I need my sleep, I need my beauty rest, all those things. <clears throat> There's many excuses that we use to avoid the work of God in our life 
thinking we're finding freedom when in fact we become in bondage of this. This is devastating to the soul, and it is a deadly sin of your relationships with you and other people, and ultimately with you and God. Ben Pratt says this, a city that prompts dangerous lethargy, stubborn sadness, world weariness, restless boredom, and cynicism. It's morphine to our spirit, squelching joy from life. Even God is no longer viewed as good. Fortunately today, the term acedia is coming back to popularity. It was very popular years ago, but now this problem is being resurfaced and re-identified, and there's great works out there. Uh, more academic work is by R.G. Snell, acedia and its discontents, and it talks about what happens culturally, and we're there of what happens culturally when we buy into acedia. There's another book written by a French uh, uh, monk called The Noonday Devil. His name is Nault. And then there is a more uh, easy understanding piece to read from Kathleen Norris called Acedia and Me, A Marriage Monk and a writer's life. And these are good resources for you to pull up in addition to the scriptures to help you overcome this battle against doing what you know you're supposed to do, but it seems like everything is against you. What is it that's against you, and how do you overcome it? Here's where you find a city most common. Places where labor is long and the rewards are slow. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> slow. My voice is changing. I guess, I guess that's good. Places where labor is long and rewards are slow or few. Acedia shows up in the monotonous day in, day out of life. And if you've got a job where it's push this and move that, push this and move that, or push this and move that, there's going to be the tendency for acedia to attack. But there's another place that acedia attacks. And where places where acedia attacks are places like marriage, where every day we're in the same relationship. And you know that person better than you know yourself. And you know as soon as you ask for forgiveness, you're going to get, again, sin again back to your wife or back to your husband. And you know how it works, and so you don't even want to put the effort into it anymore because you know how the argument's going to go. You know this is what he's done, this is how I'm going to respond, this is how they're going to respond, and we're going to be back where we were. So I'm not even going to engage with it. I'm not even going to bother with it because I know how it is. That's what Thomas Aquinas said, and he said, you've got to overcome that. You've got to engage in that. You've got to continue to work in the relationship. And if that's true in marriage, which is this long-term relationship, it's, in, it's true in another relationship, and that's with our relationship with God. And this is where death happens to us spiritually. It happens because we get tired of going to church. We get tired of listening to sermons. We get tired of going to Bible studies. We get tired of serving in this area. We get tired of doing that. And so we think that we're tired, so if we can disengage from that, that we'll get better. But in fact, we don't get better. We actually become less than who we were. Got lots of quotes for you this morning because there's really smart people who thought about this, and I'm not very smart in this area. I'm trying to learn because I am guilty of acedia far too often. Timothy Luce says, we can slip the squeeze of sloth by returning to the truth of our being in God. Simple but not easy. Why? Because in returning to our calling, the vocation of Adam and Eve, we go all the way back and look at Adam and Eve before sin, and we find them in relationship, that they have responsibility, and that they're doing good work. In other words, they tend God's garden, and they fill his temple. They work and they worship. They work and they worship, and they do that in relationship with each other and with God. When we forego the false freedom of the serpent, see, the serpent's promise was, hey, you don't have to. God's keeping something from you. There's a better life over here. If you'll just do this, then it'll be better. That is an attack of Satan that's a sedia, saying that there's freedom in that. But when we find freedom, we don't really find it there. We find it actually being bondage to us. Because the notion of freedom, of freedom of doing whatever you want to do is not freedom at all. He goes on to say, It requires us to recognize what God gives us is good, to be responsible for his gifts, and to return them to him with increase. That's our job. That's our responsibility. Rejecting the goodness of God by rejecting the goodness of things, using and exploiting rather than cultivating and growing, we are increasingly constricted by a sloth that would rather be free than well. It's a sloth that goes, you know what, I don't want to go to Bible study today. I'm not going to go. Hey, I don't want to listen to Christian content. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be around Christian people. I don't want to do those things because that's going to require something of me, and I don't want to give that anymore. And so I sit at home. I sit in isolation. I don't engage, and I think that I'm free, and I might be free from responsibility, maybe, but I'm sure not 
Well, Timothy Lush goes on to say, we are then given to boredom and despair. Left unchecked, the rejection of goodness and the violation of things ultimately becomes an all-pervasive nihilism and impulse to death. That's what's happening in our culture today in so many ways. You don't have time to talk about that. But if Evelyn Waugh said this back in the 1960s, man is made for joy in the love of God, a love which he expresses in service. If he deliberately turns away from that joy, he is denying the purpose of his existence. The malice of sloth lies not merely in the neglect of duty, though it can be a symptom of it, but in the refusal of joy. It is allied to despair. Wish I had more time to talk about that, but here's what i got to kind of summarize for you. Acedia, therefore, cannot be diagnosed by what we happen to be seeking, either good or bad, nothing or busyness, but by what we are avoiding and why. So let me ask you again, what are you avoiding that you know God is telling you to do, but you're unwilling to do that? That is a sin. It is a sin of acedia. It is a sin of omission rather than commission, and we as a church don't talk as much about that. It's easier to point out what you're doing wrong, easier for us to do that, than to point out the fact that you're not being obedient to what God says, and the challenge for all of us is to kill this sin by doing what God is asking us, asking us corporately, asking us individually to do. The Bible speaks about this, by the way, in case you wonder, is there any Bible verse today? Is he going to talk about the Bible? Well, yeah, I'm going to talk about the Bible because James 4, 17 says this very clearly, very concisely. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. That's it. That, that's your memory verse. Remember, if you're not doing what you know to be do, what you know you should do, it is a sin for you. And that sin is a sin of omission, and it's hard to pick out because no one's really looking around trying to see what you're not doing. We're trying to keep you from doing what you want to do with your sin, right? We try to restrain you that way. But there's worse sin is not doing what you know to do. In his book on the leisure, Joseph Piper explains that a person overcome with acedia does not want to be what God wants him to be. He doesn't want to engage in that difficult process. And that means he does not want to be what he really and in the ultimate sense is. We are created to be a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that we may declare the praises of him. Did you hear that this morning? We call, he has called us out of the darkness into his wonderful light. How vigilant we should be, therefore, to give praise to God in the rhythm of daily life. It is the difference between I am here, God, if you want me, versus Lord, I am here. Show me what you would want me to do and help me to do it. He embraces the remedy for acedia recommended by ancient Christians, a commitment and obedience to our individual vocation. So where do we find this in the Bible, and what happens if we don't kill this sin? 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read these words. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him at all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites, and they besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. I don't know if you know this story or not. I bet you do. But apparently, just like there was the Hall of Fame game in the NFL, which kicked off the season of sport, and just like there's the Super Cup in Germany that kicks off the Bundesliga, which I'm sure many of you are watching just like I was yesterday, but there are certain seasons when certain things are supposed to happen. Well, as a king, when the spring came, it wasn't spring training time. It was time to go battle your enemies. I don't understand how this works, but maybe there's something on the calendar that says, okay, king, go out and attack your neighbors. I don't know how that works or not. But apparently there was a time where you were supposed to wake up and go attack your neighbors. And it comes time in the spring, and King David goes, nope, not going to do it this year. I know we're supposed to battle people, and so I'm going to send out my best troops. I'm going to send out Joab, and I'm going to send out my servants, and we're going to go attack the Ammonites because they need attacking, right? And so we're going to send that. And so those troops sign up, and they go out there, and they battle, and they win. But there's a problem. The king is not where he's supposed to be. The king is in Jerusalem. And when kings are not where kings are supposed to be, kings will get into trouble. And that's true of you. It's true of me. When I'm not doing what I've been called to do, when you're not doing what you're called to do, there's going to be temptation, and there's going to be difficulty, and there's going to be problem, and there's going to be death. Because while the king is trying to amuse himself and not think about where he's supposed to be, he finds some amusement, does he not? And because he's a king, he can't stop himself. 
See, you and I are prevented from doing dumb things because we don't have enough money. I mean, isn't that true? I mean, many of us are just, we're inhibited. We can't go do something stupid. We don't have enough money to do that. We, we know if we do that, we'll get in trouble, and the police are not going to listen to our conversation. And so you and I are self-limited, and praise be to God that we are, right? But the king has no limitations. The king takes her, Bathsheba, has a child by her, and now he's in trouble, and so he's trying to figure out how to get out of the trouble because now he's got a woman who has a baby now out of wedlock, and so he figures out, aha, I'm going to get her husband to come back, and I'm going to get him to go into her, as husbands and wives do, and that'll be the excuse, and everybody will think that I am not the baby, and this is many years before DNA testing, and so I'm going to be safe on this. They're not going to put me on some kind of judge show and give me a test and prove it's my baby. I'm going to be able to say, nope, not my baby. That's... Uriah's baby. Sounds like a great plan, right? Until the problem is that Uriah is not eaten up with the sin of a Asedia like David is. He calls Uriah in and says, hey, go see your woman and turn the lights down low and bring some music and all those kinds of things. And Uriah says, hey, King David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in the booths. David, we're in battle. It's time to be battling, and, and that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm battling, and the ark is out there, and the troops are out there, and, and Joab is out there, and my servants are out there, and they're all camping in the open field. Shall I then go into my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? That's not where I'm supposed to be. And then he says, as you live, O king, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing because it is not right. And how does God honor Uriah? By allowing David to kill him in battle. See, Assyria kills somebody. It kills you oftentimes, but it kills the people around you as well. And it cost Uriah his life. Now, I think God welcomed Uriah, and he got special benefit by being killed by a Bible character. And so I think there might have been some bonus there, if that's any bonus for Uriah or not. But still, there's death as a result of disobedience, and it goes very poorly for David from then on out because he has these family relationships that ultimately destroy so many around him. So, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. So let me go back to you and not to David. What is it that you know you're supposed to be doing, that you're avoiding doing, not because you're lazy, but because you're trying to avoid doing the right thing. Here's a couple of things that I can offer you for help. How do you overcome that? Well, Kathleen Norris says this based on a review by Carmen Butcher. In the end, remedies for acedia are simple. You go do something. You go for a walk. You memorize scripture. You sing psalms. You seek community. You worship. You shovel manure. Maybe not at all the same time, but maybe all at the same time. You dust a bookshelf. You wash dishes. You study. You read. You write. And you be kind to one another. What does that mean? That means we experience the grace and mercy of God overcoming acedia by actually engaging and doing something. And as we're doing even the routine things, those are opportunities for us to worship and to allow the transformative power of the Holy Spirit to work into our lives. Now, for those of you who need a little more help, I've got a listing of three other things that you can do. Number one, you can serve at the bash today. Pretty convenient, right? Because some of you are like, man, this is going to be a nap day. Boy, it's a nap weather out there. I mean, this is good. Or hey, it's like 70 degrees in August. This is unbelievable. The world is coming to an end, and so I'm going to do some things that, that I wanted to do before the world came to an end, and I'm not going to do that. Or I don't like being wet. I don't like talking to people, and so I'm not going to go. Well, listen, that is a seed of talking, and that is sin, because we are granting you an opportunity today to love people who may or may not know Christ, who needs somebody to encourage them, and we're going to give them something away so that you look like a hero. Come on. How can we make it easier for you than that? Or number two, serve in Awana. Listen, I'm going to get grumpy here. Listen, every year we have to beg people in the church to come listen to children who are memorizing their Bible verses, and all they need to do is to tell someone that, and I have to stand up here and beg for you to do that. We don't like Wednesdays. I got to work and then I got to come home. I understand that. That's a seed of talking to you. Well, I'd rather be with my husband and go to Walmart because that's what you do when you have bring your kids to a water. You just drop your kids off and you go to Walmart or wherever it is. I understand that. There needs to be date time. I get that. But about every four years, I have to raise the panic button 
Because about every four years, we forget how important that is, and we don't have enough workers sign up, and I have to stand up here and go, hey, we're about to cancel this because y'all don't want to do this, and what kind of church are you that you don't want to hear children learn memory Bible verses to tell them to you, and you don't want to engage in that? Well, I'm too tired. I don't want to do it. Listen, that's where life gets transformed, when you're working, when you're engaged in the things that he blesses and honors, and to listen to children be engaged. And I know Wednesday may not work for you, and if you don't like kids, I'm not talking to you. We need you someplace else. Don't be with our children. Be someplace else. But there's some place in here for all of us to be serving, and the avoiding of the responsibility does not lead to freedom. It leads to death, spiritual death, where nothing tastes good, and the following God doesn't seem right. So if it's not a wanna, find some place. It should be a wanna, but if it's not a wanna, find some other place. And then here's the number three for some of you. Some of you need to sign up for baptism because you follow Jesus, but you haven't professed that publicly, and you've never been baptized. Some of you need to join the church. Had a couple show up in first, in third, first service, and they joined the church because they're like, well, we, we didn't want to go last week because everybody thought it was, we were on gluttony, and so we didn't want to do that, so now we had to wait on this week. And, now everybody out there thinks we're sloths. And I'm like, well, you've been attending for three years and you haven't joined. What other definition of sloth is there? And so we had a great conversation about that. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. Acedia is death. And I battle it. I, I, I battle this. I want to be what's happening tomorrow instead of being right here at this moment. When I was six years old, I received Christ in a kind of a strange way. I'm reading the Christian uh, children's Living Bible. And it's a living Bible. I know theologically, is there even anything truth in there? Yes, there is to some degree. And I'm reading that as a small child. I'm in the, the formal living room of my parents' house. Remember the formal living room? It was a place children were not allowed to be because that was what was clean. So in case a guest came, you could keep them there because you live someplace else in the back of the house. And so I may have been in trouble because I was in the formal living room, but I'm reading the Children's Living Bible and something happens. I, don't, I can't explain it. I've got a degree in this. I don't understand it. But I know that when my mom walked in and she says, what are you doing? And I looked at her and said, Mom, I'm a Christian. I knew that I was. Christ came to me as best he could, and as I understood it, I responded. And my, wife, and my, my mom looks at me and pats me on the head and goes, Son, you were a gorilla ten minutes ago. That's cute that you're a Christian right now, right? Because you're like six or seven. But I was, and my life was changed. But I didn't follow him in baptism until I was in sixth grade. Because I went to church every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. I was there. But there was one week where an evangelist came in, and he was preaching way too long. He preached like 9 o'clock one night. And I'm like, parents, I am not going back to hear somebody preach until 9 p.m. at night. Now, this, guess what I do for a living. But anyway, I put that in other people. And so I was able to keep my parents from going that entire week by throwing one of my fits, which I'm able to do. And so I didn't go back. And, I, and, some, and But then I come back on that next Sunday. It's the second grade. I'm in second grade. And I come back that next Sunday, and everybody in the church had been baptized. I mean, everybody, old people, young people, people we didn't even know got baptized. Whether it had anything to do with the medallion that you got if you were baptized or not, I don't know. But I show back up, and I'm, not, I'm the only one that I feel like who's never been baptized. And it took me until the sixth grade year for me to follow Christ in baptism. What is that? That's acedia that's in me. Where is acedia taking hold in your life? And will you kill it? Because if you don't, it will end up killing you and the people around you. You bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Five minutes late, I know. But there's some of you in this room today that you are battling acedia as well because there's some things you know you're supposed to do, but you're not doing them. It might be joining this church. It might be baptized. You may not be serving someplace. I don't know what it is that God is telling you to do that you're not doing, but I'm telling you, that's not just cute, that's not just inconvenience, that is sin. It's the sin of omission. And it takes energy and effort to overcome that. And today is the day for you to start and overcome that. And I want to pray for you, because this is not just happy little talk, this is serious sin, and if you continue to rebel and resist the work of God in your life, there's the danger that he might just stop working in your life. And you don't want that. And I don't want that for you. So let me pray for us that we might overcome the sin, that we might know what we're supposed to do, and that we might do what we know to do. Father, I'm thankful that your love for us covers not only sins of action, but sins of inaction. Sins of not wanting responsibility, sins of trying to check out, sins of being distracted, sins of overworking, sins of doing nothing at all.
that you overcome those through the blood of Jesus Christ and that we can have the benefit of your overcoming those sin and the forgiveness that's available if we will repent of that and trust you. So, Father, today as we worship you in these moments, I wonder what commitment that you would call us to, individually, collectively, as a nation, the Father starting with us individually, what is it that you would call us and require us to do to be obedient that we might find life so we might not be free but sick? Instead, we might find healing in an ongoing relationship with you. And may we ask these things so that you might receive honor and praise and that we might get better. So help us, Father, to respond to you in our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Would you worship him this morning? I'll be down front if there's a commitment that you need to make. Maybe there's, we've got prayer partners that'll be here. They'd be happy to pray with you. But would you come and respond and kill the sin of acedia, the sin of sloth in your life today?